if uh, if the neoliberal politics was so strongly established now here in uh, in Central Europe after 1989, the processes are very much the same like we were observing for decades or hundreds of years in Latin, Latin America. Of course, it's different level and there are diff different uh, historical circumstances and we still can say so yes, we are European. Hmm? Are they, they are similar. Different? They are similar in some way. They are, not, uh, they are not the same, of course. They cannot be the same because we still live but in Europe. You stated just now. Uh, you said they are, so they are I, almost yeah. the same. And almost the same, which means, well, which means they similar. Are but they are different. They are not the same. They are similar. Sorry. So, so uh, maybe we are not going to have a situation like in okay. Colombia with, uh, with, with cartels of NATO traffickers, etc., etc. But um, pointing out the still, still, uh, still, still, still bigger social gap and ethnic gap, this is something that really can lead to some kind of conflict. I don't want to say war because maybe this is something really very hardly to imagine, but. <coughs> Why not? Um, even even bigger is the gap, the social gap. It it always goes hand in hand with ethnical problems, as we as we see now in Slovakia. It's social problem which we have with Roma people. It's uh, or ethnical problem which we have with the Roma people is, is social problem. It has nothing to do with the, with the ethnic. I think we should mind your words beforehand. Anyway, in Yugoslavia there is a nice uh, there is an analysis of. Uh, uh, how or where the, is the beginning of uh, uh, talking about the war? And it, be, it became between intellectuals in the mid 80s. So I think you should really mind your words beforehand. What can you say? I think it, uh, it, it's funny because uh, I want to. Uh, I mean, that intellectuals in, in former Yugoslavia are yeah. the first ones who brought into context discussions about the differences between nationalist na na nation, national differences in, in Yugoslavia. They were just an outcome. Uh, it was not the day world. <coughs> they were actually uh, operative forces. Words has, for has the, the consequences still. Of course, but what so I want to say... talking about civil war in Slovakia, I mean, this is really out of, out of, out of oh. context. Why? Why? <laughs> you can't read no. the future. No, let me... Uh, <laughs> we are talking about the processes leading to war. Let, let, me, let me go on uh, with, your, with your example of Yugoslavia in comparison with Slovakia. I have one uh, meeting in mind. Uh, as a journalist, I regularly meet some people, politicians, and uh, one of these old men I always meet is Antonin Huska. He's an economic advisor to Mitchell. He was an economic advisor to Mitchell. Some of you might know him. And um, he uh, sometimes explains the situation to me, how things go on and so on. And I asked him some years ago, it was maybe in 2004 or 2003, why the HCTS changed from anti-NATO to pro-NATO position. And he uh, answered me, yeah, there was 99 between, and I asked him, what, what does it mean, 99? What was 99 in Slovakia? I don't remember. He said, it's not about Slovakia, it's about this, the war, the NATO invasion of Yugoslavia. And we understood, if we don't subordinate to this imperialist concept, concept we, we will have big problems in Slovakia. So this is not an answer, but this is a, an anecdote of, of a journalist who regularly meets um, politicians. And, and I thought this was the first time I, I, I heard this from somebody who is in the, was in the inner circle who could explain me why a quite prominent um, political wing like the HCTS is changing positions because of, because of pressure from outside. And let me, because I now have the microphone, just add two things to the rhetoric and practice of, um, of racism. Uh, within Slovakia, for instance, we could, we could see this very um, clearly when the major racist rhetoric was brutal and the Turinda's racist uh, practice was brutal. Yeah? In, 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 in 1997, 1998, somewhere uh, major said, you can't uh, make social politics with grandmothers who are pregnant, uh, directly attacking the reproductivity of the Roma with a brutal uh, rhetoric. 
And in 2004, it was Zorinda who introduced the, the anti-social laws by cutting family subsidies, uh, money for children, which led to the uprising is more or less too much maybe, but to the so-called hunger revolts in Trebišov and uh, in, the, in, the, in the East. Yeah? So, the, but this, it's more, so my question to you or to anybody, what is more dangerous? Yeah? It's, it's more or less the same framework. The one are politically uh, radical and the others are neoliberal, uh, economically radical. And both is touching the weakest, which can be different from others by ethnic or by any social aspect maybe. And this is always used uh, by, by what I am calling uh, capitalism. Actually, I, I will even more provoke you because you seem really provoked by this. And I think we are actually too soft. Too soft in the constellation that we are uh, because uh, you say mind the words, but uh, we actually we have to think uh, what's going on in the present moment in Europe. I will really call civil war or the processes that you see that are implied in the whole territory of the European Union regarding precisely the way of really uh, putting apart the way how migrants are treated. <coughs> Just the case in uh, Slovenia. Uh, we have actually, I was talking about the law before, but in Slovenia we have a case where you have uh, uh, workers for former um, republics of Yugoslavia coming to Slovenia, working, and then in the moment that they have to be paid by the Slovenian companies, state or not state company, mostly private companies, they are deported on the border, uh, on the Schengen border, deported onto the presupposition that they can know the papers or something is found as a regulatory um, moment that actually is giving a ratio to what is going on. This is really a necropolitical move, but even worse, in this context, these people are actually not even recognized by law. So they are there not even to make a possibility to recourse to the law. So they are outside of all this European regulation. So, if we think what's going on is actually a civil war in, uh, on the right way of using, or if you think about Austria, the way of intensification of the uh, way how law is functioning there, how actually is preventing, uh, for example, those uh, first uh, who are seen as asylum to study, the possibility to work, the possibility actually to, uh, to be, uh, uh, to live in uh, Austria, uh, being forced, for example, the students of our academy, some of them being forced, and many actually, not some, only some, being forced if they want to get the visa. This is this new regulation. They are forced if they have not the papers to go back in their country of origin. That means completely invisible for us in a certain way. And then they are asked that to regulate their status outside, for example, of the Austrian European context. So for me, if you think in such a way, depending where you stand, depending in which way actually you see about a certain agency, about a certain, so to call, who is the citizen, who has the right, I think we are very soft. We are very, very soft. Actually, this state of exception, this uh, civil war, these restrictions, this governmentality, this rationalization that are the outcome of this ra ra uh, rational, so to call, that is implemented. And this, that some are actually uh, those who are like the citizen, have just to have a means to live. So let live, and other are really make die. They die uh, in terms that they are completely secluded, deported, as I said. You work in Slovenia, and when you have to be paid, you are actually deported. What is this? It's pure necropolitics, it's nothing else. So I think that uh, this kind of morality, be attentive with your words, I think it's just a fake morality. I think uh, let's uh, uh, really look and make an analysis of what is going on in the European space. So if I will go back to your question that I found really interesting about uh, the necropolitical as the possibility of agency of a certain utopian space, I will actually say if it's any kind of utopy, I will call this ut utopy a political act. I will call 
call this a certain responsibility, but not as something personal, that we are affected and we now make a decision, but the political act in terms to really, uh, so to call, intensify on every level of our practice, of our life, practically this what is uh, what I call the social antagonism. The class, so to call moment. So the political act is for me the utopia. Why? Because, as I said, the space is general to history, to institution is functioning actually with the impossibility, preventing this political act. Preventing in terms also that in the moment that you do this, you are already transposed. Because uh, it's, a, I don't know, a theoretical framework that is already established, a way of behaving, a way of talking, for example, somebody will say, hey, what you are talking here? The way how you have to use the vocabulary, as I said, to be, so to call, in a certain framework, I, I'm an academic, so use an academic language, be, so to call, in the framework, and so on. I think the polit political act is precisely to really point out, to actually go over, and it's not about, over this fake morality, to point to really what are the processes. And I will say, going back to the necropolitics, that Europe is actually dead. It's completely dead in terms that is not maybe narco mafia, as you are saying, but is another kind of mafia, if you can use this. This is this bureaucratic, legal, economic expropriation that are coming together, this capital and power that are really regulating, and I think this is also visible in this uh, Slovak. A space in terms that then the law and the way of how the space is organized is just the processes of Russian, Russian so to call measures. So this will be, and I don't know, it was another uh, question. How? Homophobic society. I think homophobic society is uh, uh, just uh, uh, um, an, an academic expression between a state war and uh, postmodern fascism that is actually uh, trying to uh, explain a certain social bond. And this, uh, this is not just a relation, it's actually uh, a, a state of, uh, it's a condition uh, on which somebody can think about the homophobic society, others are actually deported and prevented to think, and they are actually secluded or they are not existing for those who just literally talk, it exists a homophobic society. Yeah. You are talking about uh, repo repoliticizing of the society and uh, you are talking about the repoliticizing of the society so uh, what do you think about uh, communism as an alternative to fascism and uh, as a political act? Uh, I, I think uh, uh, communism uh, uh, is uh, uh, an uh, uh, opposite to fascism. It was already uh, uh, after the, the Second World War. Uh, this uh, uh, antagonism was used for what? Precisely to hide uh, the colonial and Nazi relations. Simply to say, after the Second World War, after uh, um, uh, the, the moment that was uh, necessary to try to, to actually try to think about uh, Holocaust as uh, an um, outcome of uh, uh, the colonial past, go working hand in hand with the Nazi. Uh, cap capitalist uh, um, uh, formation, in that moment was produced uh, uh, in order not to think and to see this as uh, some kind of anomaly, you know, something that happened to the Western world.